Hey, hey, we're back, baby. We are back. Hey, uh, everybody. I love um, just recording and putting all this stuff on and helping everybody kind of, you know, see what we're talking about, uh, the titles and all of that. Probably most of our um, before uh, we record, we probably work on our title more than anything, don't we? Like, we're like, no, I don't like <laughs> Well, that. I feel like oh, our I title like helps us both stay within the confines of what we're trying to talk about. Yes. It's so our title uh, this morning morning this afternoon whatever time it is your time is behind enemy lines and i like that because we have been doing a series on flourishing in babylon and uh, really what came across this podcast was kind of uh, one of the sermons we preached and it was just having to talk about uh daniel shadrach meshach and abednego living in babylon where of the world, but not, we're in the world, but not of the world. Um, we're in Babylon, but we have a different diet. And mm. just trying to um, balance that, honey, right? With like they said, I love this scripture because it's so relevant is they said, hey, only give us the good looking. Only give us those that um, can speak the Babylonian language. Only give us those, you know, that have this. And it seems like the church has done a really good job of getting better at that. Probably when we were kids, the church wasn't too relevant. The church wasn't um, very uh, hip. The church- Visually aesthetic, as they say. <laughs> yes. And um and then I even remember there was a magazine that came out, Christian magazine called Relevant. And uh, and so really Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Daniel were picked because they were relevant. And mm. um, that is amazing. And we applaud that. We want our churches to be relevant. We want our messages to be relevant. I think that's a word that I use that often tries to describe my intent in a message on a Sunday. But there is this part where if we only stay there, we miss the power of flourishing in Babylon, right. or we miss the power of actually making a difference in our world. And there's no difference between us and the world. We dress the same, we look the same, we talk the same, but we know that there is power in it. So how do you flourish behind enemy lines? Or how about just even, I, I think I talked about on Sunday, sometimes we move that line uh, into Babylon to kind of fit our needs instead yeah. of actually changing our diet. Yeah. So we talked about how like being relevant, being cool, knowing all of the um, most current things are so great, but that's not what builds a church and breaks and sets people free or protects us and keeps us to flourish. And I think that's what you talked so well about on uh, Sunday morning. It was such a good message. If you guys wanted to, you could go to YouTube, watch Flourishing Church uh, last week. I don't know what the date was, but it was Israel preaching on flourishing in Babylon. And I just think it's such a timely word for everybody, every believer right now to know, you know, I, I think about Job and he said, um, you know, all of my life, I've known God. I've known the scripture. I memorized the first five books of the Bible. I was a good Hebrew boy. But after through all that he went through, the trials, temptations, living in Babylon, th that season of his life, at the end of his life, yeah. he says, I knew you, but now I've seen you face to face. And I think that this is a season if we embrace what God wants us to embrace and we allow, we don't get behind the enemy lines. We don't become Babylon to reach the world, but we live in Babylon blessed as godly people. It's like, we're going to know God. This is going to be a season of we know him face to face, not just know the rules. Yeah. And I think it's a real balance. And so I think the worst thing that I would ever want to come across is like, oh, those people, they did it that those way. Those cool kids in church. Yeah, yeah, we don't yeah, like yeah. them. No, 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 no. Because it really is scriptural that who God used was those that could be relevant in yeah. a sense. But um, we, we in any kind of scripture, any kind of doctrine, we want to make sure we get the full spectrum of it. The other spectrum of it was that Daniel's diet was different than the Babylonians. Yeah. And so diet is specifically two things. And we've talked about this before in our podcast, but we'll say it again. A diet uh, is what you avoid and then what you're intentional about putting in. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're only avoiding, uh, that's not um, a diet. That is a strike, a hunger strike, and you die. So it's not about just what you don't put in. Mm -hmm. It's also about what you 
do put it. And so that's what Daniel, uh, really, he said to the chief eunuch, hey, um, test me in this and, and see if there's a difference. And, there, and, and I think that that's a great verse, Rachel, is there really should be a difference mm. between us and somebody that is living in Babylon and somebody that's in temporary in Babylon, where we know this is not our final destination. Yeah. We're flourishing here, but we are uh, we are aliens. <laughs> we are illegally here. We're not going to be here for long. Uh, all those kind of things. Um, but we sh there should be a difference because of our diet. And I think what you were saying is behind enemy lines is sometimes we don't navigate that well trying to be relevant, then we're just like the world and we've got to work on our diet. Yeah. And so I guess our question would be today, like, what does that look like? I guess maybe we want to unpack what that would look like is how do we have good boundaries in our own life without feeling like people who are closed off from the world? Because the last thing that we want to become is what I was taught my whole life. My dad used to um, study end times and he actually had like above our dining room table, wow. he had the Middle East map and he would be like, there will be a season where we have to hide in the mountains. And I remember being like, I want to get married before I have to hide in the mountains away from the rest of the world because we're persecuted. And there was a lot of fear, but there was also this real, um, I mean, without trying, it was an, uh, I think, unintended consequence to that kind of conversation. What There wasn't a lot of power to it. It was more like, we're just going to have to survive. It, there was not a lot of faith connected to it. It was basically fear driven. And, um, and I don't think that we are supposed to live that way either, where it's like we hunker down and we have our Christian friends and everything's safe. And we move to a place where everyone else is a Christian and all of those things. I think that that can also yeah. be so dangerous. So if God's called us to live and thrive and actually see people get saved in Babylon, what do we do? Yeah, I love that. And you framed it so well. Uh, a couple different things that I would just bring up, and maybe it seems repetitive, but I don't think it is, is, um, you know, I've said this, uh, I heard it first somewhere, you know how that preaching adage is, the first time you hear it, you have to give somebody credit for it. But it's been so long ago, and I've said it so many times that now I just say, like I've always said, but uh, I, I heard somebody say, the the people that I want to meet in heaven more than anybody is Daniel's parents. And uh, just the intentionality and the discipline and the fortitude that these parents put in these teenagers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to flourish in Babylon is just wow. I mean, really inspiring. very inspiring. And it makes you go, am I doing a good enough job as a parent? Uh, but uh, and at the same time we're like yeah but we're trying to train up our girls and our son to flourish in los angeles so maybe we are uh you know on that same track of trying to do that and so i think um when you ask that question i think it goes to um it never happens by accident so i don't think right. that we do well with these lines and these questions by just well however it happens i really do think there has to be some intentionality some uh, thinking ahead. There has to be some vision casting. There has to be some, um, what is it, vision board that people are like, hey, this is what we want. Well, there needs to be some, this is what we want. Um, I know you were looking at a picture for one of your messages, like you were looking online for a picture of a desert with something growing out of it. It's like, we've got to have that picture uh, with our family, with everything so that we can really go, yeah, no, we are going to flourish. And if we don't have a plan, it's kind of like if you don't have a budget, you don't have a plan, you don't have a resume, it's hard to get a job. It's hard to do your finances. It's hard to flourish in Babylon yeah, if you ahead. don't have some intentionality behind it. So maybe these I are the it. intentionalities. Yeah, I think that, and what you're saying, I just feel so strongly about, I think that where we fall is when we don't have that vision for where we're called to go and why we're here. And if you don't, I think it's preset lines. You know, you if you think that you're going to set the boundaries for your life as you're in Babylon, it will never work because yeah. there's too many voices, there's too much pressure, it's and so we'll end rich. up living our lives in this really reactionary state instead of a we're choosing, hey, this is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That decision cannot happen in the middle of a storm. 
because yeah. when you're tired, you always make the wrong choices. You'll make the easy route, right? I'm giving myself a thumbs up and it just did that. That is wow. so amazing. <laughs> so I, I think we'll always choose the um, path of least resistance if we don't first go, okay, this is what our family or my life, this is what I am called to do here on earth. I first have to have a revelation of that. And then with that, okay, now I need to know what God's word says. What is God's boundary lines for me? Can I just read a scripture verse and then I'm going to yeah, pass it to I you? I love it. Um, Psalm 16 is so good for this. I really feel for me, especially like um, Psalm 16, verse five says, Oh Lord, you are my portion. You are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. Love that because yeah, of course it's my responsibility, but it says that God, he gives me the boundaries. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Mm. It's talking about the lines, the boundaries God gives us that they, word. they bring forth a life of pleasant, pleasant things of peace in our home, of a sound mind instead of a spirit of fear. And when we allow God to show us the boundaries that we need to be creating in our life, instead of allowing the world to define boundaries or, um, you know, trying to muddle the two Babylon and being righteous, you know, if we can, if we allow God to create those boundaries through his word for us, it says that our boundary lines fall in pleasant places. Wow, if you so want to live rich. a life without fear that is encompassed by the peace of God, allow him to show you his will and his boundaries. I don't think that as Christians, we're doing great at that. I think that we're way too um, concerned about being compassionate to sinners. And, and by saying that, it sounds like I'm being harsh and I'm not. I'm just saying we cannot um, allow the sin of man to influence where our boundary lines fall. Yeah, no, I, I, I we're on the same page on that. And it is, um, we can't change that. And God's lines, I love that scripture verse, Rachel, you could do a whole message on just that. But that whole part of God having good boundary lines is so good for us to not look at the law or to look at commandments or to look at um, the Holy Spirit. Um, convicting us as a negative, but it's actually a real positive. And uh, I don't know if this goes with it, but I also heard somebody say recently, uh, but talking about the Garden of Eden. And so in the very beginning, God even had some boundaries there. There were some lines, hey, don't eat of this, don't do of that. And the Bible actually says that that was in the middle of the garden. And um, what, what really was the first sin besides eating the fruit, the first sin was the sin of um, not thankful or grateful or a spirit of lack because they had to wow. go past mm. all the other fruit and say that wasn't good enough to then get that one thing that was off limits. And so going back to the scripture verse you said about the lines being a blessing or uh, plentiful or uh, what was the way it describes the lines? Um, oh, the scripture in here, it just says that... Um, Pleasant, pleasant lines. Pleasant. And so when, when, if you have the wrong thinking of that, that it's all about God trying to keep you from things, then you will go and change the diet in Babylon. But when you realize, no, God puts these parameters, it's like the ditches on a road or those little bumps on the freeway, and you're like, look, 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 lets you know, oh, I'm getting off. Not that it's there to ruin your suspension, yeah. but it's actually to help you stay on course. Then and I think that that changes a lot of the different ways of how we adapt to that. So I love that. Yeah. And it goes for every single area of our lives. You know, we picture boundaries as this linear, maybe you're picturing land when we say boundary lines, but I just want to say, you know, Israel and I have really strong boundaries in our sex life. We don't allow things that are on the outside. The Bible talks about the marriage bed being sacred. And so when it comes to our, our, our sex life, there are strong boundaries we have with the opposite sex. There's strong boundaries with what we let our eyes see and yeah. what gets into our heart because we know that those things, because God's plan for our 
um, intimacy is to be so pure and pleasant and trusting. Yeah. And the world in that area of intimacy can be very broken. And we, you know, if we allow these boundary lines to begin to slip, it begins to cause the intimacy of our marriage to slip. Or yeah. when we're raising our kids, um, you know, there are things that we did when our kids were little. And I remember we used to have conversations like we are disciplining you for this because we love the future you. We are, we are loving your adult self by not allowing you to just do whatever you feel or you want. We're going to give you some boundaries and boundaries are not a negative. Boundaries are actually not restrictive. Boundaries create freedom. I love that. And maybe we should do another podcast on that whole thought of just discipline and really talk about that yeah, and so just kind of right? uh, how to how to be that way because it is a negative word. And I think in culture today is is all is boundaryless. Don't put a don't put a label on me. Don't tell me what what I can do with my body. Don't you know? Don't do that. Don't t let my sexuality and uh, and like you said, Rachel. If we're not careful, then um, trying to be um, friends with that you know, we eat the Babylonian diet. And I'm sure that there were some other Hebrews there that were like, hey, we survived the journey. We're here. It's been, the food's been offered to an idol, but it's really not an idol because we know, you know, even New Testament, you'd be like, ah, oh, if you're fine with it. But there was something determined in Daniel that said, no, 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 I'm not going to defile myself. I'm going to, uh, you know, and he did all of it. And uh, I love that. And I also love Maybe it's off subject, but you don't have to be a jerk about your boundaries. You don't have to be so holy than thou. I mean, he goes to the eunuch. The eunuch doesn't agree with him, says this could kill me. David has a conversation enough in a way where the eunuch actually says, OK, let me try it. And let's test it. And I just feel like too many Christians are jerks about their boundaries and all this other stuff. And it's like, I, you know, you, we don't want to be uh, uh, eating the diet of Babylon, but I think that there's a way to do it that you actually get that too. And we can have a test. And I, I like what you were saying too about the sex and everything at the end of the of the training or the end of the test, you know, not only with the food, but with knowledge that the, uh, um, they say he's they're 10 times better and our marriage should be 10 times better. Our sex life, 10 times better. I, right. I mean, every Amen area, that, brother. every <laughs> area of our life can be so much better than the world's if we don't get behind enemy lines if we're not moving the marker over. So I love yeah. that. Okay. I don't think you're off, off subject at all. I love this conversation. I think it's so important is um, we have as a family, we have really strong boundaries. I think we're kind of like probably more bound old school. Yeah, we're a bit old school. And um, I, I'm actually thankful for that for a lot of reasons. We can get into that later. Maybe we'll talk about that next week, just disciplining your own life. That's so awesome. But um, I love what you're saying because I don't see, and you can correct me because you're the, you're the scholar more than even I am. I um, get to correct you. Oh, I'll give you permission man. this one time. <laughs> okay. But um, I don't see David talking bad about Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel? Daniel, see, yep. that's why you're the scholar. Look Sorry. at me. Daniel is not talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. He's not, yeah. he's not um, telling the eunuch that he's, um, you know, you're working wow. for a godless king, so you're a coward. He's not saying these things that are like so judgmental, yeah. so um, shame, it's shame driven. And yeah. I've never seen anyone truly have a heart change because of shame. Mm. Um, I've never seen it. I've seen a lot of legalism in my own family. I never had the heart change until I realized that verse that says that Jesus came to give his life and despise the shame. Mm, Jesus so hates good. the shame. And um, I don't see Daniel or David. <laughs> I don't see Daniel shaming the lost. I don't see Daniel coming against them with a sword and spear and trying to fight their um, worldview. He had a big enough worldview of his God yeah. 
that he didn't try to change things horizontally. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of set apartedness. He consecrated his life to God. And he knew that whatever change was going to happen in Babylon was going to happen because of his vertical relationship, not because of a horizontal thing he did. Yeah. And you know how passionate I am about this. I just, I think it's a great rule to think is, um, like he did never back down. He wasn't yellow bellied. He wasn't spineless. He did never backed away from his convictions, but he was wise in trying to stay the convictions. Right. Hey, let me have a conversation. Hey, can we try this? Oh, you don't want me to try this? Can we test it? You know what I mean? And I think that we're failing at that many times in Babylon is our conversations that we're having. And I love the other phrase that's in there. Uh, Daniel uh, prospered and it listed the reigns of what he did. Some theologians will say, um, you know, in the Bible we have... Um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have Darius, we have all these other, but if you look at who died and when and all of this, uh, would we even look at the story of Daniel in the lion's den? He's 70 years old. So the flannel graph was wrong. He was not a young man that was thrown into the Daniel's line. He was old and scrawny by 80 years of wisdom. And, and the reason why I say that 80 years is because he had been through Nebuchadnezzar's kids. He had been through the uh, when the Medes and uh, the Persians came and uh, took over Babylon, snuck in under the mm. water, uh, and then now he's uh, you know the he's giving wisdom now to the Persians. Darius, I mean, he just and you can't be a leader and make influence if you're always coming against the people instead of holding the conviction in you and living it. Yeah. Way better to live it than to say it. Is, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to well, say. Well, and when we live by the boundary lines God gives us, then our life becomes influential because the people watching it see that it's pleasant. And they're like, how come my life doesn't have that peace? Yeah. And, and God promises us this peace, this pleasantness about our home. Should When people walk into our home, because we have followed the boundary lines God's given us in the midst of a Babylon city, people should come in and go, what? peace is this. It, yeah. It's not the candle burning. It's not the worship playing. There's a peace of God. And that's the pleasantness of the boundary lines of God. And um, the thing is, that I just want to say is it's for everyone, yeah. but we all have to choose it. It's for everyone. So this is not an elite, you know, Israel and I talk about like these Christian snobs that act like, I'm blessed because I pray more than you, or I'm blessed because I've got this thing that I do that's better than everybody else's thing that they do. That's such a yucky spirit to me yeah. because this is not something that I deserve, and um, but it is something that I get to receive and cooperate with. So I think that there's two parts to um, creating boundary lines and living in that blessing of God in the midst of your Babylon. And the first thing is to um, really just receive that God has a different way that's better. Yeah. And then um, the second thing is to create be, after you've received that, then you begin to create the boundaries in cooperation with the promises of God and his word. And it, so there is this part that's a gift. But then there's this other part that it's our job. It's our responsibility to begin to build that. And it doesn't happen without us intentionally really beginning to build boundaries. I love that. And maybe to help us build a boundary, because there is, what is it? 50 shades of gray, uh, which I don't I, know. I, I tell don't. me about this. <laughs> no, but just that <laughs> phrase of, and I think we're living in it. I know it's a raunchy movie or something like that, a book, but it's what we live in is we live in these areas of um, not black and white, but these shades of gray. And um, I, I, maybe that wasn't the right analogy. Sorry, babe. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, um, Paul says something for me that has changed my life. And I hope that it can help change yours when it comes to uh, boundaries. As he says, uh, because we're Christians, uh, uh, so there's everything is permissible. Uh, but then he says right after it, which is powerful, because most people just stop on that. I could do it because I'm a Christian or grace, you know, God's love. So everything is permissible, but not everything is profitable. And so for me, that what thing has helped 
us and myself in so many things is, yeah, I, I could do that. Yeah, I did see an influencer do that. Yeah, I saw another pastor do it. Maybe it's permissible, but is it profitable? And so, yeah, yeah no, not going to post that. <laughs> no, not going to say that. It's permissible. I can. There's others that are doing it. It's permissible. Paul said this and Jesus turned the table so I can do this. It's permissible. But is the Holy Spirit telling you for this season, is it profitable? Oh my gosh, and, so um, and, and, and we have to know that. And with every scripture, we have to make sure that we know it's permissible but is it profitable? And so you could be turning the tables and it not be profitable and you're not the son of God. And so you should be careful about what, what tables you're doing. And that's the only scripture verse that you find Jesus doing that. Be wise. It's permissible, but is it profitable? And that's changed my life. I don't need the preacher to tell me what I should do, how I should do anything. I can go to the Holy Spirit and say, I know it's permissible, but what do you want me to do that's that's uh, uh, profitable? So amazing. You know, con conviction grows with obedience. I feel mm -hmm. like um, if you don't feel like you, like what does conviction feel like? I think that it's really the most simple way for me to say it is that conviction feels this like this small, very small nudge that I could ignore. And um, like I, I've just asked the Holy Spirit to help me be convicted. And I just want to say conviction feels like love like yeah. conviction never feels like i am failing usually it feels like rachel you're so much better than that yeah. you have so much more to give that's um pure than that wrong motive and so there'll be moments where i i love to post on instagram and probably people get annoyed with my instagram because it's not very cute phoebe told me like you need a cuter instagram because you just <laughs> post everything but that's so it who i am it like doesn't uh match you know it's not aesthetic through. and oh, i'm like yeah my. but i'm not that aesthetic like i'm a life like I just give me real life kind of thing. So, and, and not that Phoebe's not real life. She's just artistic, but in this next generation, I just feel so strongly. Like there've been moments where it's like something that I should totally be able to post. And God's like, don't, there's a reason yeah. why just don't do that. That's yeah. not what I want you to be putting out, or that's not what I want you to say or whatever. But I think that w we grow in our conviction muscle. The way to grow is by just not doing it. If so there's good. any reason, you don't have to ask God why. You don't have to have an, a little argument within your own heart to God like, no, but I want to because this person and this is why I want to do it. If God just, you know, stops you, like maybe you're out to lunch with someone and you're about to tell them something that's such a great conversation starter about something juicy <laughs> and the Holy Spirit's like, just bite your tongue. And yeah. um, those moments where we just obey, I've done it well where I've obeyed and I've also done it where I'm like, I'm just gonna do it because this is good yeah. and like ignored the Holy Spirit. But I think that our conviction muscle grows, our discernment grows every time we stop mm. when the Holy Spirit shows us to stop. That's such a great just, um, a practical and easy when you feel that just stop and then it's not uh here's seven steps to uh you know not go past the enemy line it's actually really good it's just learning to tune in and uh do that so i love that hopefully today you got some stuff on your commute on your treadmill walk or walking on the strand if you're in la or if you're in the snow sledding there's fun things to do when you're freezing too <laughs> letting they get to wear the cute coats out keep there keep your soul warm while you're listening but we love you guys Send we love you so much or comments all that other fun stuff and uh we'll probably continue this conversation because i like it i like you Thank you.